Hi, this is Lynn Fraser with the Killaby Center for Recovery and the Radical Recovery Summit. And I'm really happy here to have Dr. Rhonda Freeman with me. And we're going to talk about neuropsychology and the brain and some of how that works with addiction. But our main focus is going to be on recovery from narcissistic abuse and what happens to us in those kinds of relationships. So welcome, Rhonda. Thank and, you, Lynn, for having me. Oh, yeah, you're very welcome. So let's talk a little bit about your work and how you got to what you're doing now. What's your interest in that and how you got here? Well, with respect to the narcissistic abuse angle, I'd been a neuropsychologist for like a decade before I got into that. And what brought me in that direction is having my own uh, relationship with someone who I suspect is a psychopath, but, you know, being on that spectrum. And it really sort of tore my life apart for a couple of years before I could feel I was getting back to me, before I understood all that was happening. I didn't realize I was traumatized. I didn't realize I was in an abusive relationship. Um, And then after I made those realizations, I decided to use neuropsychology to help me get my brain sort of back on track. And after I was able to do that, I thought, okay, I can go back to being the neuropsychologist, doing my brain trauma work and my stroke work. But I thought, you know, if it could happen to me, it could happen to anybody. And I actually give evaluations to narcissists at least like a couple times a week. Mm-hmm. And so, and I, so I do that as a job. And so I thought, gosh, I got to help other people who, you know, don't do this as a job, but think it's them, you know, and they'll stay and stay. So yeah, that's what got me into it, my own personal pain and trauma. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So when you look at that, do you feel like there's... um so I guess it's kind of a two-part question. So yes, one is, is there something about our backgrounds, our trauma mm-hmm. backgrounds, or our maybe the brain chemistry, the neurobiology, mm-hmm. the neural networks that makes us vulnerable to narcissists? And then, and then as we get further into the, into our talk, I'd love to talk about how we, how you use the brain to actually heal. Oh but yeah. yeah start with, do you feel like there's a vulnerability mm-hmm. there to start, or why is it that we're vulnerable? Um, I do think there's a vulnerability. Um, and I want to be really careful to walk a line. There's a difference between vulnerability and it's your fault, you know, that it's not mm-hmm. necessarily our fault. Um, because narcissists are attracted to everybody. You know, you look at their partners, they get with other narcissists, they get with psychopaths, they get with people who are great, they get people who are awful. But there are there is a certain population that will... Um, stay with them perhaps a little bit longer. And it's the population that tends to be very empathic and forgiving and um, who may have had some trauma in their own past. And so because of that, they can see some of the pains of the narcissist and, and feel badly for them, you know? And so I think that maybe that group was a bit more vulnerable, but that they didn't bring it on themselves, of course not, but they're definitely more vulnerable in my opinion. Right. Right. Yeah. And so when you're, when you're looking at, um, this really serious issue of we don't see it we don't see and that was the case for me too I just I never saw what was really going on until I was actually out of it Mm -hmm. I was starting to get glimpses you know over time Mm but what's what's going on there why is it that we can't see what's going on yeah oh there's so much going on there (laughs) um for me I actually I tagged his his pathology while I was in the middle of the relationship I go oh my god this guy's a psychopath this isn't good like I've never seen one this close like actually in my life I've seen one while I'm sitting across the desk you know doing evaluations and I I know okay that's what I'm dealing with then I realized I have one in my home you know in my life um and and what's going on there, which keeps us there is what you, maybe you're asking, mm-hmm. is that we get connected just like we will with any other person. When we go through a relationship, we have systems of our brain that allow us to be attracted to and connect to another person. And they work when we're even with somebody who's a psychopath or a narcissist. And so I got bonded to this person. And the really odd thing about narcissists and psychopaths is that they don't show you all the nastiest or dirtiest or meanest parts of themselves when they first get with you. They're pretty great. They can be likable people. That's how they are able to get into a relationship, you know, because they can be fun and funny and talented and brilliant. And so we're attracted to those things just like we would be any other man or woman. But the thing is when they, sh- when they shift and they change into this other person, you're bonded at that point. And so when you're bonded to somebody, what do you do? Well, you know, for example, my son or daughter, anything going on with them, I want to help them. I'll have their back. I care about them. And Mm -hmm. you do the same thing with that narcissistic person. 
it creates what's what you know psychologists have called the traumatic bond. Mm -hmm. uh, Dutton came up with it a long time ago. Then another researcher kind of took it and morphed it and also and put it into their own words. So two different groups of people are describing the traumatic bond, and that's when you are connected to somebody who is both sort of um, intermittently damaging to you, mean to you, cruel to you, but also kind of nice to you. And then that person has some power in the relationship. And so you're sort of stuck in this sort of odd connection and other people looking at it go, that guy's awful to you. Why, what are you doing? You know, like, why are you still with this person? Um, and so that's one of the things. Uh, there's so many other things. Uh, rejection. They often use a lot of rejection in the relationship. And I don't mean like maybe overt rejection, like don't come near me kind of thing. But they, they give little put downs of you where you feel like you're being rejected by them. You know, like I can walk into the room and, oh, you're wearing that or you didn't spend any time on your hair today. Or like just always little put downs, little jabs. So I could never feel like accepted by this person because mm -hmm. they were always looking at what's wrong with you. Um, and rejection, as we know, when it comes to the brain, is it activates our bonding system on, of all things, right? It activates our bonding and connection system. And it actually makes us more connected and more focused on the person doing the rejection. My theory is that happens because I guess back in the days where we were like living among lions and tigers and bears, if your social group rejected you, that could be life or death for you, you know? And so hence you have to really pay attention to make sure you get back in to so that you're safe. And so we have all these old brain systems at work that in the modern times really work against us. As a matter of fact, I wrote an article for Psychology Today called The Brain Works Against Abuse Victims because it really does. And if you want, we'll get into them some of that a little bit later. But it makes it so hard to disconnect because of the way it's built with all these older structures. And the newer structure, the prefrontal cortex, it does all the logic and the reasoning for us. It takes a back seat to those systems. And that's the very structures that tell you, no, you know what, leave, let's go, and, and we're done. So that's a huge answer, I know, but and I only touched on two things that keep us tied in these relationships. There's more, there's even you know, more than that. Right. Mm -hmm. So as I'm listening, I'm, I'm thinking about disorganized attachment or mm. attachment as children. How does that mm -hmm. play? Yeah, attachment styles with respect to being in these relationships, you're saying? Yeah, I think attachment styles matter a great deal. Um, but the only thing is that even someone with a secure attachment style can um, wind up staying in these relationships. They can actually start to develop within the relationships an insecure attachment style with that person. Because you know, our attachment styles can, can change. It can be a certain way one one person, another way with another person, you know, you walk in, I'm feeling just very secure or comfortable attached. I feel fine. But if my narcissistic or psychopathic ex were to walk in a room, you'd probably see a totally different part of me. Like, well, what is she, why, why is she behaving this way? You know, she doesn't seem so confident. She seems scared. She seems nervous. She's paying attention too much to him, you know? So our attachment styles kind of morph based upon the person we're around, which is obviously associated with the brain. It kind of shifts into more of a survival mode, um, obviously for children who never had a chance, that's a whole different scenario because certain brain structures for them don't get a chance to develop properly. And hence they are left sort of at the mercy of a survival system that they just carry into adulthood that they rely on for most of their functioning. Hence, you know, you see complex PTSD, PTSD, and they're just more reactive to the environment, um, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, a really hard place to be. So do you work with people who've been raised by a narcissistic parent? Well, my work, my actual job is I give evaluations for people who might have ADHD, um, Alzheimer's, stroke, um, brain trauma. So I'm solely in a neurology practice. I actually don't practice psychology. So I've never, I've not been trained in therapy. I don't give therapy. So mm -hmm. no, I don't work with that population. Yeah. So part of what you've been learning about this then is just based on your own experience in life and wanting to really apply what you already know about neuroscience to what's this happening. Population. Exactly. To this population. Um, yeah, but I've, I've had some great, because I've been doing this for 10 years though in this whole narcissistic space. So right. it's not like I've just kind of, you know, read a couple of books, whatever. I had a chance to really interview, for example, some neuroscientists who actually do this for a living, like um, Michael Koenigs. He's a neuroscientist at University of Wisconsin. He, he's actually responsible for a great deal of the research 
that we know about uh, psychopaths because he and his partner would actually take uh, MRI portable ones to prisons and pop the psychopath in there. And that's how they got, we, we know what we know about the brain of psychopaths from his work. Mm-hmm. And so, and then I used to work for um, Aftermath Surviving Psychopathy, which is a group by, uh, by Dr. Robert Hare. He's the one who made the book uh, Without Conscience. And so I put myself in, in circles of people who really, really, really know this topic because I wanted to make sure if I was going to learn it, that I learned it from people, you know, who kind of lead the field. And then, and I appreciate them so much. Um, and then after that, of course, I did a great deal of journal reading. And then obviously I work with, as you know, I said, psychopaths and narcissists when I do my ADHD evaluations. And so when I do those, those are about six hours long. And, you know, you really get, you get a flavor for for the brain of a narcissist or psychopath working with them that much, um, mm-hmm. that long. So yeah, so that's my background with them. Right, right. Yeah. So what's the link between ADHD and psychopath? Ah, uh, psychopath. Yeah. Um, there's some research that some say none, but there's some research that says that's not true. That, for example, when you have ADHD children who have the um, coexisting oppositional defiant uh, disorder or the conduct disorder. Um, there's been research to show that they can actually segue into children, I'm sorry, adults who are antisocial. And of course, as you know, antisocial has within it psychopathy. And so it's kind of always been there. It's just, of course, you don't, you don't call a child a psychopath or, you know, antisocial. Um, and so the link is that some of the same brain regions are, are implicated with ADHD and psychopathy. Uh, a, a prefrontal cortex is not quite functioning the way it should be with regard to regulation. And then some of those children with ADHD, clearly not all at all, not all, um, but some of those children, they have the self-regulation problems on the emotional end of things where there is a coldness, a callousness. And so that's where the link comes in. When it comes to narcissistic personality disorder, the ones that have more of the hyperactive style are the ones research is saying have more than narcissistic personality disorder features when they grow up, when they get older. So yeah, same brain regions, just we call it different things. I think perhaps we as society want to make sure we're not saying things that are so hurtful to a child by imposing on a child, but it's the same brain, pretty much same condition, just adulthood versus um, childhood. Okay. Yeah. Um, One of my nephews was um, born with profound damage in his brain. He really never developed a prefrontal cortex. Oh, no. And... um, it was really, you know, he, he suffered a lot and he was on, he was heavily medicated too. And he had a really tough time of things. But one of the things that, yeah, I know it was really hard. He knew that he shouldn't yell at somebody that he would get in trouble if he did that. But, but it was just, you know, that what was coming up in his brain was so difficult and in his whole system. And yet he was also the sweetest, most loving person at times too. Oh, good, good. So it was this, it was a funny thing though, you know, because you look at when he was medicated a certain way, mm-hmm. then the love could be there. Mm-hmm. And when he wasn't, it was this other stuff that kind of take over. Wow. And it's so, um, our brains really determine. Oh yeah. Like we have. Absolutely. And, and then, you know, as you said, mentioned medication on top of that that can change so much you know it dulls certain certain regions and then amplify other regions so you know who knows what he was going through you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what are you seeing in your field of Mm -hmm. um, neuroscience and you know especially as it's applied to people's lives you know that you 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 work in the area of of narcissism and yeah you also work in this other area too where you're where you're doing yeah. with people. What do you think of the whole field of neuroscience and psychology and and where we're headed? Oh well, um, I mean, you know, I think it's everything. <laughs> I think it's everything, but um, I think that it should be used more in therapy, you mm-hmm. know. And so, like for example, I work for a, another practice. Um, it's it's more of a psychology practice, but I, I only do neuropsych there too. Mm-hmm. And we have therapists there. And I love it when we share a patient, a therapist shares a patient with me. So I'll see the patient first. And then I recommend the patient have therapy because I don't do therapy. And so, which means the patient usually signs off and lets them have a copy 
uh, the evaluation. And so at that point, I then do a consult with the therapist and say, look, this is the limit. These are the limitations we're dealing with. This is what I think you should approach him because of how his brain works. And so they, and they always have the same feedback, like, wow, like if we could just get that kind of approach for before we saw every patient and be so helpful. And so mm-hmm. I wish that what would happen is that not that they got trained to be neuropsychologists, these therapists, but they got mixed into their curriculum, a lot more neuroscience. And, but neuroscience, just the part that they need, like not all that I had to go through, but the parts they need, which would be the parts regarding um, how the prefrontal cortex works and how there's various ways, problems with that area show up. It's not just one way, you know, I mean, there's ADHD, there's so many other ways it shows up. And so if they got education on that, it would make therapy make so much more sense. And also it would prevent people, therapists who work with trauma victims from re-traumatizing their patient. Because if they understood what was happening in the brain, they would understand by telling the person, let's talk about this, what happened again and again and again. You, you, you would know you were, you were not helping the person with that. You were hurting the person with that. And I, I liken it to if a child had something really horrible just happened to them. Would you sit and tell that child, okay, tell me what happened and tell me again and tell me again and tell me again. You wouldn't, you would, you would have the sensitivity to know that you would be destroying that child by doing that. And it's the same thing with adults. So the one thing I wish that society would know and our field would know is to incorporate neuroscience in there. It would really help you better help your patient. And then I explained to her what narcissistic abuse was because it was to my surprise, she didn't know. Um, and so, yeah, I talked to her about that and I was able to explain to her what it was, the different brain areas that are involved with her and what were the most, um, prominent psych features for, I also do psychological evaluations, obviously. And so I was explaining to her the most prominent psychological features of that patient so that she could really just hone in and focus on those first. So she, the, in that way, her, the therapist got to see, okay, what I should do first, what to work with on this person first. And she also got the chance to already have the other person examine and diagnose for her. And so she sort of had a head start. And nowadays with insurances, you know, you don't get many visits. So they need to be used, you know, properly. Right. right. Yeah. So what what's the um the short kind of explanation for what is narcissistic abuse? How do you spot it? Oh, like what yeah. kinds of things would you have outlined for her? Yeah, uh, you know, when it comes to that term, it's not really a term that's recognized in, in the field of psychology. We kind of just like across the past few years made it up. <laughs> okay. But I, it was made up for good reason because it really highlights a very specific type of trauma. It's not like rape, it's not like child abuse. Um, it's, a, it's a type of trauma where you voluntarily walked into a relationship and fell in love with somebody. And because of that person's pathology, because they can't consistently keep a relationship and because they have faulty neuropathology associated with their um, bonding and connection system, which is called paralympic system of the brain and morality, it cannot be moral. This person morphs into who they really are after the relationship sort of takes off. And so you've voluntarily gotten into a relationship with somebody like that, who then starts pumbling on you emotionally, maybe even physically. Um, and hence, I think that's a very unique relationship, very unique form of trauma. And so, yeah, I, I, I understand. And I definitely use that word narcissistic abuse. So the neurobiology of it, I think is huge. I kind of created the neurobiology of it because (laughs) I was a victim. And so what I did was I described my own brain and, but I didn't just describe and say, okay, this is how it is because of my own brain. Then I had just a wonderful opportunity to be able to communicate with thousands of survivors and victims over the past decade. And they were fitting that exact same pattern. And then that's when I said, okay, I'm ready to put it out there and say, this is what I I think it is. And so I think that it's an overactivation of certain um, systems of the brain and underactivation of a couple of systems. Underactivation of our self-regulation system, not the whole thing, but a portion of it, the, the prefrontal cortex. Uh, overactivation of our bonding system, overactivation of the reward system, overactivation of the pain system, and overactivation of two of our stress systems, and underactivation of a component of our cognitive system. So our ability to remember, ability to feel motivated, ability to feel organized and say, okay, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do that, or feel in the motivation as in, okay, you know what, I know it's good for me to go out and take a walk or go to the gym, and but once you're traumatized, you don't, that motivation just like plummets. You don't want to do anything. It's like you feel like you can't even be your own advocate at all because you're just so beat down. 
And so those are the, our major systems of our brain. We have several, but those are major ones and they're all going haywire in different directions simultaneously. And this is why I find, I believe that narcissistic abuse is so unique and it needs somebody who understands it to, to help you. Right. Yeah. yeah. Cause otherwise you could waste a lot of time on things mm -hmm. that aren't really relevant. Uh, and you know, that's a great point that you raised because when it happened to me, you know, as you know, as I said, I'm not a therapist. And, and so I'm, I'm, you know, in the medical role, just turning out these neuropsych evaluations. So I thought I'm going to go to a psychologist and she's just going to, oh, she's going to know exactly what to do and help me. And I went to her and she, she, first off, she says, you know, I don't like the fact that you're tagging him a diagnosis. Don't do that. She goes, it's not necessary. I go, okay, but I'm a psychologist. It's like, well, okay, oh, I, won't, I won't get the diagnosis. And she um, then proceeded to have me try to rehash all the scenarios where he had me feeling the most sad or the most scared. I mean, and, and, you know, my guy was a psychopath, so he was an intimidator. You know, he was a scary figure. Um, and so I would always leave out of there just crying and shaking. And I needed a few days to get myself back together. And then I would dread her appointment the next week. Mm -hmm. I'm like, here we go again. And so I used to ask her, like, why, where are we, are we gonna, is this going to stop? Is this pain going to stop? Because you're making me feel like worse. And she's like, no, we just want, we want to get it out. We want to get, and I, and I thought to myself, that's when they click, like, that's not how the brain works. It doesn't have a bucket, get it out system. We have a activation, deactivation system. She's activating my pain. Hmm. This is not the best approach. And so, yeah, I, 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 I wasted a year, uh, almost a year going to her. For no reason. <laughs> yeah. That's too bad. Yeah. yeah. And that's a year that you were in that relationship? No, the year after. <laughs> right. I'd already left. I was I, I didn't recognize myself. I didn't understand I had, you know, symptoms of PTSD and all that. Um, but and so I went to her to try to get help and she pretty much she told me this was a really bad breakup. And that for some reason I'm having trouble accepting the breakup. And I was mm -hmm. trying to explain, no, but I don't like him. She goes, yeah, but you're focused on him. Now I understood that's called traumatic bonding, where you don't like somebody, but you're still attached. I kept telling her, yeah. I don't even like this guy. Like, I think it's disgusting, you know, but for some reason, I can't get him out of my head. And she's like, yeah, you just, you're having trouble just letting go. And I thought, okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those, those are reasons that I think that incorporating neuroscience in the curriculum or not even, you know, for those who are out of school already, then for, you know, the CE credits to, you just have to, you got to make it part of what you do because you are treating the brain, whether or not you believe it, if you're a therapist, you are treating the brain, <laughs> like you are. So yeah, at least yeah. get a good understanding of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It kind of feels like a bit of the dark ages, mm -hmm. you know, in psychology when people aren't really aware of the brain. And now there's so much more about the nervous system yeah. and how does the nervous system fit in with all of this and attachment. And, oh, yeah. and I know that, you know, talk therapy has, it's been really clear for a while that it's not just talk therapy that we need. We need other, mm -hmm. other things too. Yeah. Yeah. 100% right. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about dance and movement? And mm. uh, I see you were a cheerleader in the NFL for a Yay. while. That's kind of awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was fun. I was with the Miami Dolphins and the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, yeah, movement is so important. I saw you had some experts who are experts <laughs> in that area. So like my little <laughs> take, I'll keep mine very short because your viewers can watch the other ones who like pioneered, you know, this area. Um, turn it off, so sorry about that. Um, but yeah, dance was is really important because um, one, it allows for certain neurochemistry to get released when we move. And two, it activates the prefrontal cortex. And that's really important for people who are in the midst of trauma, because that's the area of the brain that's going to kind of save you. When that part is up, it's your regulator, it's your calmer. And it knows what to do when it's properly connected to its other areas. It will know what to do. You have to do nothing. So as a matter of fact, if you're feeling calm right now, that is your prefrontal cortex doing its job. And you're not having to do anything about it. It's just doing it. Yeah. But after you're traumatized, you can feel constantly on edge, just not yourself, even or even the opposite direction, numb. I remember feeling that I couldn't access joy and that made me cry, you know? So I'm like, where is the joy? Because I'd always been such a joyful, happy, bubbly people, a person rather. I was fun to be with and I love to be with other people genuinely. 
And during that time period, I wanted none of that. It was just like, I just was numb. Um, and then when I was finally got the motivation to move and dance again, and it was choreographed dance, I would get like little videos and I would watch those and do the choreography. And I just started to feel so much better. And so, you know, I look back and it was because I was activating my prefrontal cortex. I was giving it what it needs. It's better than sitting and telling someone, okay, well, last month he did this to me and then he said that and it made me so scared. And it, it does a world of difference, you know, in comparison to those two things. One hurts you, one makes you better. It makes your brain better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, last year I interviewed James Gordon who does uh, this with huge groups of people, like a thousand people who get them doing shaking and dancing. Oh, and, wow. And I'm just like, wow. Yes. <laughs> that seems it like powerful it's powerful but it feels it felt kind of scary to me when he first started talking about it. i'm like how do you control all that energy that <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic point I love that you have to control it <laughs> yeah. yeah but i started doing it um oh, good. i practice every day almost for quite a few months oh. and I, I should probably start it up again because i loved it so much so how shaking, did you feel with it how did you oh i just felt so alive yeah and the shaking was so good because it kind of gets everything out and gets yes. you moving. But yes. then the dance was so creative. Mm -hmm. And and I, I live in the forest, so I could go out in the forest oh. in this clearing where nobody could see me and I'd put yeah. on the tunes. And <laughs> That's so nice. Yeah. Oh, your environment. I'm jealous. Oh, I would do anything to be in the forest. So. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice to have that nature. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nature's mm -hmm. so important for the brain. Then I noticed you have a a dance kind of hip hop video on your website. Like I yeah, I just want to give an example of watching someone do choreography and yeah, just doing a choreography. Yeah, moves. I had nothing to do with that video. I just found it on YouTube and they're, you know, it's shareable. So yeah. Oh, right, right. Yeah, put that as, hey, start with this. Or if you love country, then of course go find a country one. Yeah. Like whatever you want to do. Right. You know, right. and I think also music is is really important too. I like the combination of the two because music activates the brain in so many ways it's one of the things that can be very healing for the brain um i mean i don't know if you knew that for you know gabby gifford the um senator oh, oh yes. she yeah so she yeah she was she was unfortunately she was shot in the head and she couldn't speak and part of her treatment they use music to treat her because she could not formulate words. So they would, they, I saw this recording, for example, where they had her repeat a word. She could not say the word, just couldn't. And say, say, they said the word, she tried to say it, couldn't say it. So the therapist got out her guitar and started playing this little light of mine, I'm gonna, and Gabby just started saying, let it shine. And they were like, okay. Oh. Because music is, sort of handled by many, many different parts of the brain. Whereas our language is just left frontal, which is, okay. you know, and if that part isn't there, you can't, you can't formulate words. Whereas music is all over, it's right side, it's left side. And so it grabbed it and she knew what the song was and she wanted so badly to do it and it came out. Yeah. And so that's how they, they used, neuroplasticity was used, the, the approach was used to help activate neuropathways that got her speaking again. And now she can formulate sentences more than words, you know, she right. can speak. Yeah. Right. Wow. So music is so powerful right. yeah. um, for, for our mood as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you mentioned too, is that choreographed dance is good. Cause then we have to think as well. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I, I like to take it up a notch. So yeah, that's why I say choreographed because um, you have to, you're, you're then now you're bringing in your hippocampus, which is memory. And one of the things is we know with things like PTSD, conditions like PTSD, it really impacts the hippocampus of the brain. There's right. been um, studies that show that it starts to shrink. And then hence, that means later in life, even just the normal age changes that everybody will experience, no matter what your memory changes with age, they will have even more profound memory changes because they didn't start at the regular level. They've been so impacted by trauma, the hippocampus starts to atrophy. And so I want it to person, if you're going to do dance, do something that's going to activate a lot of different brain areas. So why not bring in choreography? So you have to remember, uh, visual spatial skills are brought into that. Timing is brought into that. Um, so yeah, this, I want to make it a little complex. So I said, do choreograph dance. But if that's too much, start off with just, moving your body, just getting into it, <laughs> just feeling it. Right. right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and I, you keep coming back to the prefrontal cortex as being really yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah. I love the prefrontal cortex. <laughs> I love it so much. About, back in school, uh, my professor for my birthday brought me a book called The Handbook of the, of the Frontal Lobes. <laughs> it was my favorite book I ever, because I was so in love. He said, I've never seen somebody love the frontal lobes more than you. So I've been in love with that section of the brain since I was in my 20s. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so what does that section of the brain do for us? Oh, so much. Okay. So it's involved in um, sort of keeping us calm, monitoring behavior, regulating our emotions. It has very strong connections with our limbic system. Our limbic system is our, for people who don't know, the emotional system of the brain. And it keeps kind of a handle on that. It keeps you from getting too anxious because sometimes there can be nothing really to be anxious about, but then you're feeling, you know, really nervous. That part of the brain keeps that uh, system kind of calm. It's involved in morality. It's involved in empathy. Um, wow. It's involved in shifting from one thought to the next. Have you ever been like such that you can't get a thought out of your mind, ruminating, um, intrusive thoughts? Um, there is sort of a gear shifter called the um, anterior cingulate cortex. It kind of is a tie between the, the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. This guy is like right in there. Um, and if that part is having trouble, you'll find yourself having these intrusive thoughts being shot into your head and you think, oh my God, I don't want to think about it. Or ruminating, chewing over a thought over and over and over. And you're like, my gosh, I can't shift out of this. Well, the prefrontal cortex handles all of that. It's our personality. Mm -hmm. So it keeps us from behaving inappropriately. We know how to behave in certain social situations. Like if I have a patient come in and they are, you know, like it was a man, let's say, and they'll make a sexual comment, you know, right away, I know, okay, something's going on, going on with this frontal lobes, you know. So I'm kind of like on alert for, let's see what else, what other evidence I get, because that's completely inappropriate. We know that you don't walk into a doctor's office and make a sexual comment, you know. Right. So it's our frontal lobes that handle that. Um, I, I evaluate a great deal of frontal temporal dementia. And, um, and one of the sad things about that is that a lot of times the other doctors will misdiagnose it, not our practice, our practice knows what they're doing, but, but other doctors like primary care doctors because a frontal temporal dementia often can look like a psychological disorder. It can look like mm. the person's just very anxious or a person's just sort of, I don't know, stressed out, you know? And so by the time we get them and the neurologist goes, ooh, there's something going on here. You know, I do the neuropsych, the neurologist does his stuff. Um, and we realize, okay, we're dealing with a frontal temporal dementia. So that will change a person's personality. It will make them um, very focused on like, believe it or not, eating, eating a lot of junk food, sort of lack of control of self. Uh, the frontal lobes are associated with our speech. Um, I can just go on and on. It, it has so many different roles. So depending upon the section of the brain of, of the rather the frontal lobes is what handles the different jobs concentration, what's called working memory. Working memory is like when you do mental math, um, you like say, I don't know, 87 times 12. We got to remember what you carry and what, you know, that's uh, the working memory system um, doing that. So yeah, it does a lot. It is a lot. Mm -hmm. So if we were to tie that in with childhood trauma, so yeah. someone has maybe abuse, but maybe more on the neglect side, they're just not connected with, they're not mm. seeing, um, but maybe abuse too. So what kind of impact does that have on the development of that part of the brain? It has a great deal of impact because if, if there's any fear for that person or, I mean, as a child, we need love. We all need love. Mm -hmm. But so there's, a, there's going to be that hunger for love and you're not getting it. So the prefrontal cortex doesn't quite develop as it should. So it doesn't become the regulator that it's supposed to be. Um, and so other areas, like the older areas, are going to develop no matter what. You know, the survival system is going to just keep on doing its thing. And so we might see for those individuals as adults, they might be more reactive. They may be more prone to um, feel depressed, feel anxious, maybe turn to substances to soothe themselves because the internal soother, which is this guy here, the prefrontal cortex isn't doing the soothing. So they need something external to make them feel, okay, I feel okay, I feel whole now. And, and their choice of what they choose to fill that void could be anything external. You know, it could be just maybe using other people in a sexual way, it could be anything. Um, and then also we have an oxytocin system. That system is highly dependent upon it being activated um, throughout the lifespan. And so there's been studies that show that 
um, a person who's neglected as a child does not have as many other proper receptors. And so if they, let's say, get love when they get older, they may not be as receptive or it may not be received in the same way as someone who was given that, given love their whole life. Because that system's up and running and fine. But this other, this person who didn't have that, that system never really got a chance to be used properly. So even though oxytocin is generated, the impact is not as profound on them. Right. So they may not be so comfy cozy with the hug from somebody. Like the hug may not mean as much. You know, someone said, oh, let me give you a hug and you feel better. And they don't feel better. Like, what is that about, you know? I was reading something recently about um, looking for comfort from other people. And when you ask someone to, you know, visualize a time you feel safe or something, mm. quite often people will think of a person or an animal. Yeah. But then there's a whole subset of people who will think about nature. Yeah. Because oh. it doesn't really occur to us mm -hmm. to that we would get comforted that people are trustworthy or, mm -hmm. you know, which is really sad. It is so sad. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yet our brains seem to really um, collect the evidence. Mm -hmm. Oh, it. yeah. It keeps it. It keeps yeah. it. And it's interesting that you say that because I, a lot of my patients are in their, um, in one practice I work at, they're in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And um, they've never seen a psychologist a day in their life. So they're, they're nervous wreck when they're coming to see me because they think that, you know, am I crazy? Is that why I'm being sent to you? And I go, no, Chris, not. You know, we're going to crazy. Uh, this is going to be fun. We're going to have we're gonna enjoy ourselves. We're going to do some testing. And, and once they get to sort of trust me, and then they start letting things out. And sometimes they'll say something like, um, you know, I, you know, tell me about an abuse in, in the past. And they ask me, why am I holding on to this? You know, I'm 70 years old. Like I've been miserable with this my whole life. Like what is wrong with me that I, I didn't let it go. And they actually carried that as their responsibility. So I'd have to explain to them. It, it literally is not voluntary. Like we have sections of the brain that holds that. And so I go into explaining why it holds that. And they're so shocked that, wow, like they didn't do this, you know, the whole time. But unfortunately, we're also getting messages from, from family saying, like, let it go already. You know, it happened years ago. You were 20 years old. You know, what, you know it's over. Yeah. Right. And so it sounds like a societal thing that we're being told that you can let go of trauma. And so back to the education thing, there's like, it's great. Let's teach kids calculus, but also let's teach them about people, you know, like just throughout the, 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 the let's say maybe sixth through 12th grade, make sure we incorporate that we're teaching them about how people are made so that we're not out there traumatizing someone even more by telling them, oh my gosh, let go of it. It happened 15 years ago. You know, right. that kind of thing is so painful. Yeah. yeah. And so much shame. Yes, exactly. She definitely, I mean, the person I'm thinking of, she's felt so much shame. She was even afraid to tell me because she thought, you right. know, like, God, what are you going to think of me if I tell you that I've been holding on to this? And I'm like, no. Mm -hmm. yeah. So does brain science tell us how to help people work with those kinds of stuck trauma experiences? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. So what kinds of things um, would now, I don't work with a treatment in, but like, for example, uh, doctors like uh, Bessel van der Kolk, he talks a great deal about how they're using neurofeedback to help individuals. Um, there are brain game, game strategies. I will definitely stand behind those because when I got treatment, that's what I used. I didn't do the neurofeedback, but I did the brain trainings. And within a year, I'm not kidding. It, I was back to me. I was like, wow. Like I couldn't believe because I was, I was going through life. I was doing my job, you know, I almost was happy when I came to work because I'm like, God, at least at work, I don't have to think I'm not about me. Cause I can definitely throw myself into a case of patient. And it was just like, I was on. And when, when five o'clock rolled around, I'm like, Oh my God, like, oh, here, my. here we go back to me. You know, like what am I going to do with her? You know? And, mm -hmm. but for, so I worked, I did the brain trainings for a year and I was just like, so shocked. So I went back into the, you know, to see um, what, what, what the literature was still saying about it. Because when I got trained to be a neuropsychologist, I got trained also to do cognitive rehabilitation treatment with brain trauma stroke patients. So I did that for, for a few years and like, mm -hmm. I didn't get the bright idea to do it on myself. <laughs> Until, oh. uh, you know, <laughs> until a year after I tried traditional psychology with my, my psychologist, it was only then that I was desperate. 
And I thought, you know what? It worked for them, you know? And when I was working with them, let me try it for me. Even though I'm not brain injured, I'm injured in another way, you mm -hmm. know? And so, yeah, so brain trainings are really great. Um, and, and you definitely, when I saw your work, you've interviewed people who definitely take the somatic interventions. That's not my area of, of expertise, but clearly the research shows that that works um, mm -hmm. with respect to paying attention to, you know, um, the impact that trauma has on the body and working with the body versus just doing sitting and doing talk therapy with the right. person talking about what happened, you know? Right. So, and again, I'll say to everybody, I'll leave you all to look at those videos because those are the experts on, on, on the somatic <laughs> interventions, not me. Right. Um, and then, you know, neuropathways, just understanding, I think for me, it was really important to understand what neuropathways were being activated in certain ways. That's how I ended up living my life. But I don't know if everybody else can do this because I just know that I pay attention. If I'm around certain per a person, I'm sorry, certain people, and I feel like hmm, my body's being activated in a certain way, or there's a certain system of my brain that just feels like it's just hijacking my frontal lobes right now. Like, what is going on? I know, whoa, pay attention to that person. That's something about that person. I can't have them in my environment, or I can't trust them, even though they're wearing the most beautiful smile and being so sweet, but the real, the, the something's not right. So I've learned to give so much attention to what my body and my brain is telling me. I trust that so much more now, whereas before I would trust what the person said to me or maybe what they were showing me at that moment versus even though the red flags are going off right and left in my body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so I think those are ways that we can implement blend neuropsych, I'm sorry, psychology and neurology together. Right. With regard to if, treatment. If someone wanted to do some of the brain training, where would they look to find those mm. kinds of programs? Yeah. Um, I, I use a professional one um, most of the time, but that's just because I had access to it because of my job. Um, you can also go to a neuropsychologist who does this, um, mm -hmm. you know, so find somebody like that. Um, there are commercially available games I've not used them like Lumosity and like Brain HQ. I think Brain HQ is pretty good, um, but those are commercially available. We're talking self care healing. We're you know I'm not saying use Brain HQ in place of seeing a actual neuropsychologist. Like that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that when you want to do the doing something every day to work on your brain on your own in conjunction with somebody else overseeing it, then do something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if you find yourself just doing problem solving type games, those will activate your prefrontal cortex. Right. Yeah. Right. They're good for our brains. Our brains need to work. Really do. Absolutely. Yeah. Because you need to activate those neural pathways of, of regulation, which will let the, the limbic system know, okay, things are calm, things are good, and you know, we're safe. And then the frontal lobes will do its job. Under real emergencies, you know, you're not going to prevent the prefrontal, I'm sorry, the um the limbic system from act being activated. If there truly is an emergency, something going wrong, believe me, the limbic system will jump into action. It'll right. override that prefrontal cortex. It's got your back always. Um, I'm talking about when it's running the show and you're just simply sitting watching TV, you know, or you're trying to have a dinner with, you know, your family and you're feeling like on edge and a nervous wreck and miserable. That's right. not the time for that system to be running the show. No, no, no. I think it's really good to know what our different systems are and what they mm -hmm. do, and what's appropriate. Yeah. For myself, what I found was that I had a lot of trauma as a teenager. And then the first kind of in my mid twenties, I got into the first relationship where I felt like this person really loved me mm -hmm. and really wanted to protect me. And that was all so new to me. And that's what made it me so vulnerable mm -hmm. to, to the emotional abuse that uh, I just couldn't see it. And so for me, I think it was a long-term kind of a freeze state. Mm -hmm. And then just, I was vulnerable to that because I hadn't had it before. Had it. Yeah. And so I can look that, back at that now and see, wow, I stayed in that relationship a long time. Mm -hmm. And I can see why. Mm -hmm. But I also wish I hadn't wasted so much time, you know, in a way. But but, but it's not, learned. Like, yeah. I learned and it's yeah. not voluntary. It's like our nervous system mm -hmm. is just saying, is not it's that trauma bonding thing you talked about at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he was good to you at some point, right? He was nice to you. Yeah, it was a woman actually, yeah. but yeah, she was. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt like, you know, we, we were a team and we, you know, we were working together and, mm -hmm. 
And I had all of those romantic ideas about that. <laughs> and then but I couldn't really see what was really going on. So the power of denial to me is... Oh, yeah. <laughs> pretty much. I was there, so I know what you mean. Yep. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Totally. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the program that you have that you offer oh, yeah. uh, on your website for people. What, yeah. what, can you just describe what that is and, and who mm -hmm. might be interested? Yeah, it, it's for people who you definitely have to love <laughs> science okay. because it is really heavily science um, because I want to make sure that you get why you're behaving this way because I want to knock out that shame, like feeling like you had no control in this because this is how the brain operates. It is just what it does and you can't shut those parts off no matter what you do. And so I describe the neuroscience behind each one of the brain systems that I talked to you about earlier. And I also give an example of what it looks like in narcissistic abuse. So, but I start off giving the scenario, okay, this is this person, she's going through this and this is a system that's being impacted. Before all that though, there's a questionnaire and it will ask for it before each system do you have any of the following? So we'll have to check off and, you know, see, because that system may not be activated for them. For me, all those systems were activated. But if it's activated for them, they may pay a little extra attention because then after they get all the education about it, then there's a section about this is what you can do about it from a self-care perspective. But also then I talk about if you get within a professional, this is what they should be focusing on with you as well. And so we go system by system doing all of that. Um, then at the end, um, I have... Um, a discussion of some of the myths like there's a big myth of um that only people who are codependent get with narcissists only and and that's a yeah. that's an extreme oversimplification of of psychology and people um and i mean if, if i wish people were that simple my my job would be a piece of cake oh this then that no there's yeah. this and it could be that it could be that it could be that, that i mean it's so many different you know i mean you know, so who knows so i i have a section where i talk about let's not oversimplify and, and slap labels on things. And I talk about what you mentioned, the attachment, how profound and powerful, absolutely powerful our attachment system is and how it changes and, you know, and all that. So, so the course is for people who have um, experienced narcissistic abuse and they want to know what happened. They want to know how their brain changed and they want to know how to move forward and what they should do for, from a self-care perspective to move forward. And so there are parts that are heavily focused on neuroplasticity because I also talk about that too. Okay. Yeah. So what are a few of the things that people might learn around taking care of themselves and healing from that? Yeah. So for example, um, some people are still going through the trauma bond. Um, they're recently out of the relationship and they are like writing me and saying that I, I, I cannot stand this, this man, this woman. And yet, Every morning I wake up with them in my head. Every night I wake up with them in my head. I'm actually thinking of spying on them. I look at their social media, you know. And so um, I have like a trauma bond book in the course. Mm. Book lit rather, like a workbook. Um, mm. And so it gives different strategies of, of what a person can do to get clear about the two sides this person has, you know. So for example, mm. you said that your partner, she was, she was, she had some great parts to her and you felt like you had a partnership with her, but at the same time you felt like this person was abusive to you. And so the brain actually looks at those two things as being in a conflict. And so since it can't resolve the conflict, it's like, well, we're just gonna be connected. And and, and you're connected, but it was the worst thing to be. But so I try to help them resolve that conflict through various exercises in the book so uh -huh. that they can, if they can resolve a conflict, then there will be no bond because you, you now will can see the person for who they really are. It's kind of like breaking denial. You know, you see the person for who they really are versus holding on to the fact that they may have been a good person at one point. They had these, they were nice, they were helpful, um, but they're not safe. So that's one of the things that's that's in the course is the trauma bond workbook. Um, uh, that was one of my issues too with him. I knew he was a psychopath, but at the same time, he'd been one of the most helpful people to me, you know, and, and it was the strangest thing. And it's because yeah. he, and he also knew how to activate my empathy. We have an empathy system and that's why you have to go no contact people if you are um, with these individuals, because if you are an empathic person, 
they can activate your uh, compassion system of the brain. And when that happens, it almost erases the bad stuff they do. Your brain just goes, oh, well, you know what? I'll let it go. I'll let it go, you know, because that system's so powerful. And so, yeah, that was one of the things I had to, um, when he was reaching back out to me, I said, no, 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 no. So I blocked the number, everything, because I knew that he could get one sob story, you know, or say, oh, you know, I'm sorry, things went down the way they went. And I'm not like, well, okay, no. Yeah. You have to, don't allow that system to be activated. It's, right. it's a horrible system. You know, I heard a story probably 25 years ago about a group in, um, I think it was South Africa or somewhere in Southern Africa of when when a woman was in an abusive relationship mm -hmm. her relatives her sisters or whoever it is mom would take her somewhere for about three months her and the kids they would just take her somewhere and they wouldn't allow her to have any contact wow with I thought what yeah Man, I love that <laughs> oh we <can> just <laughs> do that here <laughs> it's not like a retreat like a lockdown retreat just go stay. <laughs> no, nope. three months they they get their mind back and That's they can. That's right. Really. You broke it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess we can do our own version of that. But that yeah. always, that just seems like such a wonderful way to get support because we're not seeing clearly. Mm -mm. No, you're not. Like, there's actually been studies done. Uh, they had um, people who recently broke up with a boyfriend or girlfriend, and they put them in that fMRI, and it showed that the frontal lobes were like dull in comparison to the reward system, which was super high, you know, which was obviously telling them to stalk the guy to to go get him, get her. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Actually, neurologically, you know, supported. Yeah, that was what was going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think probably the most interesting thing and most hopeful thing is that our brains can change. Oh, yeah, yeah. Stuck with whatever. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. You're, you're so, so right. Cause I, I felt, um, when I did my traditional psychology, I felt a little bit hopeless for a little bit. So I thought, Oh my gosh, am I just unfixable? Like, is right. this me for like, the rest of my life? Like how I kept thinking, how am I going to do this? How am I going to pull this off? Like, how can I just mm -hmm. exist? Existing feels terrible, you know, existing and of course pain. Um, yeah. but yeah, that was when I just decided, you know, like I literally sat down myself with paper and pencil and I, Rhonda, you do this for a living, like work with the brain. Why can't you help yourself? Pretend you were a patient. And I had to self distance and say, like use words like Rhonda um, yep. and, and wrote down if she were my client, what would I recommend? And I just wrote a treatment plan for myself. And really big on the top, I wrote activate her prefrontal cortex, you know, huh. because, right. and, and that was, yeah. and I just took it from there. Yeah. Right. Well, and then if an fMRI shows that dullness, Mm -hmm. That's really good evidence that, in fact, our brain's not working well enough for yeah. us to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We really need to, I think, looking at that, like, if, what would I say to my client or or what would I say if it was my sister or my yeah. you know, my friend or something? Mm -hmm. That's a that's a helpful way to look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah with different types of narcissists is interestingly what I found it would often be like one with a narcissist narcissist who has very strong histrionic traits so they're like the life of the party you know they are woohoo hang with me and they'll wind up with a malignant narcissist who's more about bringing down the hammer of control and coldness and dominance and power you know they're like the and the, the histrionic seems to be histrionic narcissist is often attracted to the power of the malignant and the malignant has such horrible social skills that they're attracted to the social skills of the histrionic. Mm -hmm. But often the malignant will hurt the histrionic narcissist. So one of the things I think I want to share before we go is that it's it's not really possible to have um, to make it work with a person on the narcissism spectrum. And I mean the actual disorder. I'm not speaking of someone who may have some features or some traits. I mean the actual true disorder of narcissistic personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, which is also including psychopathy in that mixture. Um, because one of the things I get asked, and probably the most common question is, you know, it's thank you for the information, but now can you also give me some tips of how I can just stay in this marriage and how I can make it work with him or make it work with her um, without getting damaged by it. And, and no one can give you those kinds of tips, unfortunately, because our brain, it, it reacts to everything. It's one of the organs that is so responsive to the environment that it, 
someone walking in here who is a really warm person, it'll actually make my oxytocin rise and I'll feel good. Someone who walks in here who's a scary person, my brain's going to react again. It's going to put my my survival system out front. It's going to make me be careful, vigilant. It's going to be watching that person. I may even feel fear, anxiety. My heart may start racing. So it's a reactive organ. So there's nothing anyone can tell you to make it work to manage its reaction to this kind of person. And so the reward system, not reward system, the um, stress system getting activated repeatedly can lead to trauma. You know, the experience of trauma can lead to PTSD, complex PTSD. So these individuals can change you. If you are aware of that and you still want to stay, make it work, then at least have that awareness that you will be changed. Um, If you don't want to take that risk and deal with trauma for the rest of your life, then the other option would be to go. But there's no doctor who's going to tell you, yeah, do these things, you'll be good. There's no way. So you can't really protect yourself from the damage of Mm -hmm. being in a relationship like that. Exactly. Because the brain is doing its job. It is telling you this isn't safe. This isn't good. This is going to hurt us in some way. And it perceives emotional pain just like it perceives physical pain. It's not doing a huge differentiation in there. So it doesn't like either one. And it's giving you cues like, hey, hey, this is bad. And so it, it won't be able to manage that because it's just doing its job. Right. And on top of it, it gets more sensitive the more times it get activated. I don't know if many of you knew that, oh. but you'll start off at one sensitivity level. And the more times you are insulted and hurt and harmed or, or, or in fear, walking on eggshells or dealing with a rant or narcissistic rage or whatever you have to deal with, each time your sensitivity, stress system rather, becomes more sensitive, a little more sensitive, a little more sensitive. So then it takes very little to set you off emotionally for you to feel like freaked out or, or stressed out. Mm-hmm. So it actually, yeah, it almost has like a shelf life. It's about so much it can take before it starts getting more and more and more sensitive. Right, right. And then it would just take that look or a tone of voice yeah. or it doesn't have to be a rage or a no. thing. Mm-hmm. It could just be that. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It, it'll change you. That's the one thing that's hard to, to revert back to normal, I will say, after narcissistic abuse. Um, that's the thing I never got back. No matter what I have done to work on my brain, I've been working my brain for a decade and I never could change it. I changed the sensitivity a little bit because now I'm not as reactive because right after the relationship, I couldn't listen to music because it was just too much. I couldn't, I couldn't play music for an entire year. I couldn't dance, I couldn't nothing. I was just like, you know, frozen. Um, but the, and that change, but not tremendously. Like I'm still very, very sensitive to the pain of other people. If I hear an animal being harmed or anything, like I will ball into tears. I've got to do something about it. I've got help. Whereas before I could, that definitely upset me, but I, it, I was like, I was stronger to be able to, oh, I'll handle this. Whereas now I fall apart about something like that. I can't handle it. It's just, it, it upsets me too much. So that you won't get back. Once the amygdala gets turned to a certain sensitivity level and the insula, because that's just, that's the brain system that handles our pain. And those two things mm-hmm. in combination become really sensitive. They don't tend to revert back. Yeah. No. Yeah. Mm. So wish. people can do a lot. I wish, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So people can do a lot to improve things and Mm -hmm. in terms of who we have in our lives and good boundaries and those kinds of things. There are some things we'll always have to be Mm -hmm. more careful about. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If there's anything that I know now that have like really strong boundaries is because I think to myself, I didn't work all this, you know, hard for this person to (laughs) to pull me back. So I have boundaries even just for that reason. I get like a little bit indignant. Like, you know, are you kidding me? I said, no. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's good. Yeah, not sitting in front of a bunch of video games for another two years for you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. This has been really fun and interesting. Thank yeah, you. I'm glad that we could do this. Yeah, me too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mm-hmm. You can reach Dr. Rhonda Freeman at neuroinstincts.com. Welcome to the 2021 Radical Recovery Summit presented by the Killaby Center for Recovery. This is Lynn Fraser, your moderator. This year, our theme is Feel It, Heal It, a new paradigm of recovery featuring a diverse group of thought leaders and innovators 
people who are working on the ground in the new field of addiction recovery. Go to RadicalRecoverySummit.com to sign up and watch free.